It is Friday, June 30th. Let's talk PlayStation. Hello everyone, welcome back to another caramelized episode of LTPS. We've got a big one this week. The ongoing Microsoft versus FTC proceedings has had so much crazy stuff come out of that, so we've got a lot of news items relating to that alongside some uh, smaller ones as well. So uh, let's begin as always with our PS Plus reminder. This is your last call to grab the June PS Plus Essential Games. Grab those before they go away. July 4th it's going to change over to Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War on PS4 PS5, uh, Alan Wake Remastered, PS4, PS5, and uh, Endling, The Extinction. Endling, Extinction is forever on PS4, PS5 as well. Um, certainly an interesting month when we consider Call of Duty being on there uh, in the midst of this ongoing custody battle, more or less. Uh, well, you know, a transaction at, at its heart, but um, I, I think this just kind of goes into the, the sort of uh, idea that a lot of people are still prescribing to here, which is that uh, both Sony and Microsoft are withholding deal announcements or acquisitions or things like that because they want to sort of not make these things public to sway the outcome of this transaction one way or the other. But um, as we've seen before, and certainly with this, not the case. Um, you know, not only are confidential documents a part of that process already, so it doesn't matter if they're public or not, uh, but you can't, you know, halt business operations for what is more than a year now at this point because of this acquisition. So as we've seen with this um, and many other things, um, the kind of folks that are that are responsible for arranging these deals are not being explicitly told otherwise to not do these things. Um, now, perhaps more importantly is the, uh, well, there's 10 more games leaving PS Plus Extra and Premium, so these will be... Uh, going off the service sometime next month and uh, I mean this is a really big PSA uh, big red alert here so you better get your game time in stray the 2022 game of the year we cannot deny its existence it's leaving PS plus extra uh, next month so make sure you play that game or just subscribe to play it right away or just buy it I'll advocate for all those options uh, or you could also maybe try Bioshock Remastered I guess that's a genre defining game from the PS3 and 360 era so yeah you could play that one and also fluster cluck as well we might uh, we might as well shout that one out Moving on to our first story, we have some sales data for Final Fantasy 16, where Square has confirmed, and this is in their words, but they say they've shipped and sold digitally 3 million copies worldwide so far. Now, that is quite good given the circumstance. So uh, I think for a lot of people, they're a little bit confused on, you know, judging if this is good or not. But in context, compared to, say, Final Fantasy VII Remake on PS4 back in 2020, that was uh, 3.5 million sales after three days. And that was when the PS4 install base was at like 100 million plus. Um, that alone is a very big delta. And then going back to Final Fantasy 15, where that was multiple platforms, uh, remember that that game had a huge marketing buildup and hype machine around it because the dev cycle was so long and, you know, also factor in the development costs of how that game was rebooted. And, you know, so I, I think given all that, um, you know, that game did 5 million on day one. So that was a, a series high. Uh, but when you consider those two projects uh, recently, you can see how 3 million on 3 million and less than a week on PS5 with an install base of less than 40 million. Yeah, quite good. Um, so I would hope that Square is happy with that number. We never really know with Square, uh, you know, considering they do ship all these what appear to be commercially successful games, and then they go on record during, you know, investor meetings and things that all these games did not meet expectations. So um, we did see the producer say that they were nervous based on pre-orders, but uh, it seems like the demo and the word of mouth really is going a long way. And seems like it was uh, totally worth it because uh, not I'm not far in the game, but I'm really enjoying it so far. And uh, yeah, I'm just happy for the entire team where it seems like there was a good amount riding on this uh, game and, and more importantly, the direction they took this game. So while it does appear to have its flaws, um, this could be a really good starting point for really evolving the Final Fantasy franchise in a, a new way that we haven't seen just yet. Next up, we've got some confirmed details for the Metal Gear Solid Master Collection Volume 1 when it comes to what games are included. Also, physical editions being confirmed, that's good, but there's still been speculation on what is going to be included in Volume 2. So, this goes into a viral tweet from the Twitter user at Nitroid, who's the host of the Kojima Frequency Podcast. They pointed out that the official website added buttons to the timeline for the games in Volume 1, but when inspecting the page, there's placeholder buttons for MGS4, Peace Walker, and MGS5 as well. Now, 
They do clarify with more context on why this is suspicious, referencing the timeline graphic being old and that they seldom make changes to this, but making adjustments to the buttons, that is something that's new. IGN followed up on this with the story corroborating the speculation, saying they understand that lineup to be accurate based on sources they've spoken to. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that's confirmed. I mean, this is all still speculation, a rumor, so, you know, that's where we are. But the big elephant in the room here is very much Metal Gear Solid 4, the game that has been this entire time only on PlayStation 3 natively, unless you decide to emulate it. But uh, yeah, we, we could be on the precipice of this game being available on modern PlayStations, Xbox, Switch, PC, right? So that's a, an exciting prospect, I think, for a lot of fans that never had the chance to actually play this game, especially when you go back to PS3 and the game is a little bit rough with frame rate and things like that. So, um, you know, th it's kind of a big deal. But um, my gut reaction to seeing the Volume 1 announcement right away was that, oh, okay, so MGS4, it looks like the, you know, it's finally time. But I'm like, would they really put that in a collection? I feel like that game by itself, you know, if they're going to go through the, the hassle of porting it natively to, you know, modern hardware, like, I don't know, I, I feel like the sort of uh, very easy publisher play is to ship it standalone, 40, 50 bucks on, you know, all those systems, and then uh, another volume of this collection could be all the other games that, because uh, there's a lot more that they could do, right? Not just MGS5 and, uh, what do you call it, Peace Walker. So that's what I thought, but either way, I think this game is bound to, <laughs> bound to show up eventually. Let's just wait for, excuse me, volume one to ship, and then we can start theorizing and waiting for Konami to talk about volume two. Moving on to our next story, it looks like Rockstar Games has a VR project in the works if a recent resume from uh, Michael Ursu is to be believed because that resume had, uh, well, it showed the existence of a unannounced VR game from Rockstar Games. It also made mention of a new Borderlands game and uh, also something unannounced from the um, Genshin Impact developer Mihoyo. Uh, it's since been removed, but there is speculation on what that game could be. And considering, you know, in the VR space, there's only a few major players, PSVR 2 included. Um, you know, maybe we'll see a Rockstar VR game, which is a, an exciting prospect. Now, it could be, well, I would say it's unlikely that it's the, uh, that Grand Theft Auto San Andreas uh, VR port for the MetaQuest 2, which was recently announced. Um, they're not going to be doing new voice lines or anything like that for that game, presumably, uh, even though we don't know a whole lot about it. But um, we do have a AAA open world VR project from the studio that did LA Noir, uh, the VR case files. So I would assume it's that unless Rockstar is also looking to do another Grand Theft Auto <laughs> 5 port, a new, a new version that would be a proper VR port. And that might also be why I think they sent that uh, cease and desist out for the VR mods for their prior games, right? So um, either way, that's where we stand. I think that would be kind of a, 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 a pretty high caliber marquee title for PSVR 2, assuming that is a platform that this game is coming to. All right, let's get into the Microsoft versus FTC preliminary injunction news. As we discussed last week, that was the first few days of the proceedings. Now we've got the remaining days and uh, we'll try to cover some of the more pertinent items, but really they're all kind of big. So uh, let's begin with something we were not supposed to find out about, which was a Jim Ryan document, which did have redacted info on there. But uh, what happened was the lawyer was using a Sharpie on paper, which was then photocopied. And we can still see what they crossed out because if you just zoom in and increase the exposure, you can make out what they were trying to seal away. So uh, we did find out about some budget details for some uh, well-known PlayStation Studio titles. So as an example, Horizon Forbidden West had the development start in 2017, which is not too surprising, but the cost was $212 million to make that game with over 300 full-time employees. The Last of Us Part Two began development in 2014 and cost $220 million to make with over 200 full-time employees. Now, we always knew these games were, you know, a nine-figure budget. Uh, it's a huge undertaking with a lot of um, resources, a lot of staff, and this and that, which uh, that might actually be a bit misleading. So those employee numbers are all in-house. When it comes to outsourcing, you can have 1,000, 2,000 people all have a hand in uh, have a hand in, uh, you know, bringing these projects to life. So it's just, it's so much that goes into it, right? But it's still enlightening to get some exact numbers on just how big of a scale some 
some AAA projects and certainly for PS Studios, how big these things can get. Um, the rest of the document does have some info relating to Call of Duty and its importance on PlayStation. So. Um, we got a few uh, metrics here, like for example, this is a really weird one, but uh, there's one million gamers that play nothing but Call of Duty. So there's some telemetry out there that says there's PSN accounts that have not started any other game on their PS4s or PS5s except Call of Duty. And apparently Sony's 2024 marketing deal with Activision does not guarantee a game release. Basically, late 2023 is the last one on paper that is guaranteed to release on PlayStation. As for what the franchise means to Sony, it generated $1.5 billion in revenue for the year of 2021, and when you're accounting uh, this, the, the average Call of Duty player uh, themselves and they're spending across consoles, games, accessories, subscription, that's about $15.9 billion per year. So in theory, that's what's at stake if a Call of Duty player ever leaves. Uh, we also learned that Sony doesn't usually require subscription exclusivity for games on PS Plus, whereas Microsoft may require this if they sign on a day and date release, barring that game from going to a competing service. Now this is particularly noteworthy because this goes back all the way to the Brazil Cade proceedings, I think, where you know we had caught wind that one tactic Sony uses uh, for PS Plus in their games is that they try to block games from going to Xbox Game Pass, um, or they have deals in place to do something like that right and so uh, we're paraphrasing I can't remember exactly but you know it's as we said at the time because uh, this entire process as we acknowledge it certainly fuels the the fanboy stuff right it's just it's straight lighter fluid to that fire easily during this entire thing um, so when that came out obviously it's a lot of flack you know being directed at Sony and so what we were saying at the time was that yeah they probably do that but Microsoft will have the same strategies, right? Um, it's more a matter of what they value versus the other one, right? So Sony is pretty um, aggressive with standard third-party deals for a la carte games. Um, but it's not like Microsoft doesn't to some degree do this for a lot of their games that also release on Game Pass day and date or the, uh, you know, the, the standard third-party stuff that they'll do every so often. They all do it. There's no good guys here per se, but um, I, I feel like it didn't need to be said, but there is some proof that Microsoft very much does uh, the same as well. Now that was on day three. Three, four, I think it was. It's all kind of a blur at this point, uh, but we'll try and uh, loosely go in chronological order of what came up during the proceedings. So now let's move on to when Phil Spencer was being asked by the FTC, uh, or rather he was being grilled by the FTC's lawyer about um, you know how he views Sony as a competitor, if they're you know an aggressive competitor, to which he agrees, saying, and I quote here, Sony is the market leader with a considerable capability and an aggressive competitor. Editor. Every time we ship a game on PlayStation, Sony captures 30% of the revenue that we do on their platform, and then they use that money among other revenue that they have to do things to try to reduce Xbox's survival on the market. We try to compete, but as I said, over the last 20 years, we've failed to do that effectively. When Phil was questioned about Microsoft considering skipping PlayStation for Activision content, he said he doesn't remember a specific conversation, but it would seem like a normal conversation for them to have. One exhibit from the FTC shows a conversation between Phil Spencer and the former Xbox CMO where they both agreed Minecraft Dungeons should be exclusive to Xbox. Of course, the game did eventually ship on PS4 and Switch. Uh, speaking of which, the reason why we never got a native PS5 version of Minecraft is because Sony did indeed withhold dev kits from Microsoft. The FTC argues Microsoft retaliated by still not offering a PS5 version nearly three years later, even to this day. The FTC continues pressing Microsoft on if the Switch is considered a current-gen console or not, because they're mostly trying to get Microsoft to admit it's not directly competing against and that the Switch is not relevant to the high-end console space. Now, when the FTC asked Phil about Elder Scrolls VI and if it's exclusive or not, he said, and I quote, I think we've been a little unclear on what platforms it's launching on, given how far out the game is. It's difficult for us right now to nail down. It's so far out, it's hard to understand what the platforms will even be at this point. One big bombshell that came out, though, is that a big motivator for the Bethesda acquisition is because Sony was looking to secure Starfield exclusivity. He says, and I quote, When we acquired ZeniMax, one of the impetus for that is that Sony had done a deal for Deathloop and Ghostwire to pay Bethesda to not ship those games on Xbox. 
So the discussion about Starfield, when we heard that Starfield was potentially also going to end up skipping Xbox, we can't be in a position as a third place console where we fall further behind on our content ownership, so we've had to secure content to remain viable in the business. So, a lot to unpack there, uh, given that we heard about this a few years ago, around the time PS5 came out, before PS5 came out. Um, the rumor at the time was that Sony very much was looking to secure Starfield exclusivity. Um, and we can see that more or less with Deathloop and Ghostwire, that they had a good relationship and they were, you know, certainly talking things out. And so this more or less proves that those rumors were true. Sony was, um, you know, and again, this is another rumor, which was they're courting all sorts of third-party publishers, making any sort of deals and arrangements they can uh, with marketing, but also timed exclusivity. Now, that is uh, about the top end of what they do unless you're Final Fantasy 16, where, um, and we presume that game is probably gonna be locked down on console in perpetuity, uh, but um, that's about the top end of what they do. So uh, the defensive play here from Microsoft, because it, the implication is not that they would lose Starfield entirely. Um, Deathloop, Ghostwire, and Starfield would eventually make their way over, but um, the defensive play is to just, you know, buy the whole publisher and, you know, position yourself in the market so you're not, uh, you know, always losing this content to Sony uh, for at least a year, like a year delay, which still makes your platform not the preferable one to pick up. So, um, and we've said before, like at the time, that is a play that, you know, it, it makes sense in the context of Microsoft wanting to secure IP, uh, especially given they've had a historical problem with first party IP. But uh, that was uh, interesting to hear. And we can certainly see how Phil wants to not have to, you know, be on record to say, yeah, we plan to ship the game on PlayStation because they very much are likely not planning on doing that. Um, and they're very careful with their wording around Call of Duty uh, and that franchise. They'll certainly commit to shipping it in the here and now and for the foreseeable future, which, you know, in Microsoft's eyes is 10 something years, but who knows when we're talking about platforms past PS5 and, um, they go further into this with uh, all the talking that's been happening during the entire process, but how the that play has a big angle of Game Pass and cloud and not necessarily uh, console exclusivity. Now, when we move on from that, we have the 2019 email in its entirety from the Xbox Game Studios head, Matt Booty, where he sent this to the Xbox CFO, Tim Stewart, uh, and he does say that Microsoft is in a very unique position to, uh, quote, go spend Sony out of business. So further down that email, he says, and I quote here, if we think that video game content matters in 10 years, we might look back and say, totally would have been worth it to lose 2 billion or 3 billion in 2020 to avoid a situation where Tencent, Google, Amazon, or even Sony have become the Disney of games and own most of the valuable content. Again, Microsoft called this a thought experiment from nearly four years ago that they have not explicitly executed on, and they do claim that the, uh, the strategy here has been changed. But we are seeing Microsoft has an acquisition watch list and they were considering, well, pretty much everyone to some degree. So this could be from a handful of smaller studios that release well-known titles to larger studios like Bungie, mobile studios like Zynga and Niantic, and of course, publishers like Sega Sammy. One email from Phil Spencer back in 2020 was about a request for strategy approval, which proposed Sega as a viable target for a myriad of reasons. We also learned Square Enix was also a target to bolster the company's lack of Japanese games, drive value to Game Pass, and get their foot in the door with mobile. So looking back at the Bethesda acquisition, that certainly was a big deal and very disruptive, but it wasn't until the January Activision announcement that the perception around all this changed where it's like, oh, okay, you know, nothing's off the table, anything is possible. So that's where, you know, it's been a year and a half of speculation on, you know, what's Microsoft going to do, ne uh, do next, what's missing in their portfolio, uh, Japanese games, we're seeing, we're seeing they're very close to Sega, so maybe them, Square would be a, a big money uh, get right where they just kind of throw enough at the, uh, the publisher and maybe they'll bite despite them being a Japanese publisher. Um, there's been so much talk and speculation around all that, but now we have confirmation that very much, you know, they were considered to some degree. Now, you know, Today, as it stands, nothing happened, so we don't know how those conversations went, if they even so much as got to conversations in the first place. Um, you know, you can throw a lot of money at, uh, you know, an acquisition target, but they still might not bite. So there's all these other things to consider. But um, yeah, when we saw Activision, it's like, okay, they're probably approaching 
basically anybody. And uh, that's what we learned this past week, is that there is a number of targets. And yes, big players like Zenga, Niantic, Square, and Sega were considered. And when you look at the context of that 2019 email now, you know, they probably thought at the time that wasn't going to be seen. So it's uh, one of those things where you see what was written in 2019 and they were already making acquisitions uh, acquisitions back then. What they're, um, you know, focused on doing now with all these uh, other possible targets, not to suggest that Microsoft is very much looking to, you know, spend Sony out of business, but they probably are to some degree, right? And so that's uh, one big bombshell that we found out as well. Now, at this point, we move on to the SIE president and CEO Jim Ryan's deposition, which was a pre-recorded video. So they play this during the proceedings. It's about a little over an hour long, but this is where we learned more things. So uh, most notably, Jim Ryan said he did expect every major Bethesda game to be multi-platform prior to the acquisition. He also confirms they withheld PS5 dev kits from Microsoft and that there's no contract they'd rely on to safeguard them from the risks associated with a competitor having knowledge of their hardware. Um, and as for Microsoft's offer regarding Activision games, Jim says Microsoft last year only committed to offering older games. As an example, the list included Overwatch, but not Overwatch 2. Now, at this point, it was already established that, uh, well, from the Jim Ryan email that, um, and also Phil Spencer confirmed this during his questioning as well, but uh, after the initial January announcement of the acquisition, uh, Sony did not have major concerns. We talked about that last week, but Jim Ryan now clarifies it was an email from Phil Spencer on August 26th, 2022, that really set alarm bells ringing. We don't know what it was, but that's the timeline we have right now. As for Microsoft's game exclusivity like Redfall and Starfield, Ryan says, and I quote, I don't like it, but fundamentally I have no quarrel with it. I don't like it, but I don't view it as anti-competitive. Now, back in February with the EU hearing, uh, Jim Ryan did confirm his talk with the Activision CEO Bobby Kotick, where he said to him that he wanted the, he wanted the merger blocked because he thought the transaction was anti-competitive, and Bobby Kotick apparently wanted to cover himself and arrange a new marketing deal in the event the transaction doesn't go through. We also learned about a February meeting Jim Ryan had with Fidelity Investors, where he said all publishers unanimously do not like Game Pass because it's value destructive. Now that one right there is not even so much of a, of course, Jim Ryan would say that kind of thing where he's bad mouthing subscription uh, and trying to put off this kind of image, but we can see plainly that most big publishers are not launching games day one into subscription, right? So, uh, and that's the caveat is that we do see smaller studios can benefit greatly. Um, indie studios where between Sony, Microsoft, they can easily foot the bill to, you know, give them a lump sum that, um, is going to easily exceed their expected day one sales. And so they get their bag on day one and then they get the word of mouth exposure for more a la carte sales on top of already exceeding their day one sales, right? So it, it can work for smaller games like Stray and, um, you know, Fall Guys and this and that. But when it comes to the big publishers, we see most of them are not doing this. Uh, if they do, they experiment with older games in their back catalog or, you know, with EA Play, they'll launch games on there, but you still have to pay a fee to some kind of fee to buy the game a la carte, right? So it might be discounted, but um, Microsoft is still the only one that's kind of doing this where they're, you know, <laughs> dropping a ton of money and even cannibalizing their own sales in the interest of subscription. And it's something that we know Sony is very much not looking to do. And most other publishers that may not say it outright, they're also not actively doing it. Um, the CEO, the Take-Two CEO, Strauss Zelnick, is uh, another one that has openly opposed the, the model and how it works for at least, um, you know, large budget video games. Now, at this point in the proceedings, it's uh, the 28th and the 29th, where it's a lot of, uh, I guess, more boring stuff. Uh, expert testimony on, again, if the Switch is or is not a competitor. Um, and then also the viability of Call of Duty and if it's exclusive to Xbox, you know, what does that mean for the business? Um, then they also make arguments back and forth about cloud and how that all fits in. And then the next day, so that would be the 29th, this is where Bobby Kotick was questioned. So we got a few things here about how he regrets not releasing Call of Duty on Switch and that making a lesser version of the game on PlayStation wouldn't make any sense. Um, 
then the Microsoft CEO, Satya Nadella, he, he's then questioned about cloud. And uh, when talking about game exclusivity, he does go on record to say that they want to get rid of it on consoles, but that it's not for him to define given that the most dominant player, which is Sony, is using that tactic to define the space. Considering this entire process so far, it's been just such a wild, turbulent ride, one where I can certainly understand why a lot of people are just tired of hearing about it because they want an outcome and they don't care what the outcome is, um, you know, whether you're, you're an Xbox fan and you're going to be for it because it's a great get for Game Pass and the Xbox business, uh, or you're on PlayStation and you don't care about ABK contents, so you're like, whatever, or maybe you do care about it and you want it to stay, um, you know, regardless, there's we're seeing so much about the business and and, well, not exactly a shocking revelation, but seeing the motivations behind this company, uh, behind both these companies, I should say, because Sony does play a role here, right? So um, it's been uh, pretty nutty, but, uh, you know, I can say it's, it's one of those things where... Um, you know, for me, I've always been, I guess, more 60, 40, maybe getting closer to 30, 70 on the whole thing, which is, you know, 30, 40 uh, for the acquisition, 60, 70 against. You know, it's one of those things where I, I don't want PlayStation to have this ultra dominant role and they're just squashing Xbox into submission and they're not doing bad in their current standings uh, without Activision Blizzard, but I certainly don't want them to have a smaller footprint um, down the road where some of the things they're experimenting with and trying out don't pan out and we see Xbox either downsize or always stay in this third place where um, they just, they're always overshadowed. I mean, I, you want a healthy Xbox and I, I like the, the hardware. I like the games. I, you know, I, I don't want them to go anywhere, but to that same effect, I don't want, uh, you know, a situation where they're so out of position that, you know, they, they can't make moves like these, but it's such a big move and that's where it doesn't sit right with me, right? So it's about that consolidation. And um, while there are certainly some things that are good in the short term for Xbox and the business and will certainly solidify their um, their place in the market by having this transaction go through, it's still uh, just such a big deal that I think uh, in terms of net positives, 10, 20, 30 years, which is hard to speculate on, but I, I feel like there are no net positives when we look at 20 years down the road and they have this kind of leverage on so much valuable content and IP. And ideally, I would love to see them go, go out and build studios from the ground up as Sony has done historically, but uh, it's just not easy. And so I'm not sure what the best path forward here is uh, or what outcome really does make the most sense in the long term, but. Um, you know, it is something where I, I, I think we have to tread it you know, carefully on things like this. So um, it's been quite a process, but with the FTC versus Microsoft, we were certainly enlightened on a number of topics. And uh, again, we're seeing the motivations for a lot of companies come in full swing here. And they're certainly trying to, they're, they're trying very hard to earn your dollar. And uh, some, some of them have more aggressive tactics versus others. With all that said, it is time for Let's Talk Plus, the weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway where one of you can win a $10 PSN code. I would like to congratulate this viewer right here. I'll be contacting you very soon via email or Twitter. And if you'd like to win a $10 PSN code, it's very easy. You can follow the link down below. Supporting this channel, a number of ways can gain you an entry. And I'll announce the winner next week because I'm trying to help pay for your games. Those are all the news stories from this past week that I wanted to talk about with you all, and our Tuesday video was looking at some old PS2 memory cards, booting them up, and uh, maybe finishing some of their save files. Uh, got a little PS2 nostalgia kicking in, so I want to play some PS2 games. That was a good excuse to do just that, so you can go check that out. And as always, another upload on Tuesday, but until then, that is it. So that concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Bonecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me, and I will see you all next Friday.